Are you grappling with the complexities of weaning patients off mechanical ventilation in the ICU? Trust me, you're not alone. In today's video, we're diving deep into the art and science of ventilator weaning. From spontaneous breathing trials to personalized weaning protocols, we've got it all covered. So, if you're an aspiring intensivist or a medical student looking to up your ICU game, you won't want to miss this. Stay tuned. The history of ventilator weaning has evolved significantly over the years, marked by key milestones. In the late 1940s, Dr. Ibsen introduced positive pressure ventilation during the polio epidemic in Copenhagen, revolutionizing respiratory support. In 1955, Dr. Carl Gunnar Engström launched the first volume-oriented ventilator. In 1961, DRs. Henrik Bendixson and Henning Pontopidan established the first respiratory ICU at Massachusetts General Hospital and initiated research on ventilator weaning. By 1977, Henning, Shubin, and Weil employed esophageal balloon catheters to measure the work of breathing in detail. In the 1970s, synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, SIMV, became the preferred weaning mode in most ICUs. Before SIMV, the common practice was to disconnect patients from the ventilator for short periods and assess their tolerance to sudden discontinuation. In the 1980s, studies on patient ventilator interactions revealed the limitations of SIMV for weaning. By the mid-1990s, there was a shift in focus among intensivists towards comparing various modes of weaning from mechanical ventilation, MV. This evolution underscores the complexity and importance of ventilator weaning, requiring ongoing research and expertise in critical care. Definition of weaning Weaning is the systematic process of reducing mechanical ventilatory support for patients whose underlying cause of respiratory failure is improving. It is considered a continuum that starts with full ventilatory support and progresses towards lower levels of support. Criteria for weaning readiness These are a set of clinical and objective measurements that indicate a patient's readiness to begin the weaning process. Common criteria include recovering POW2, FiO2 ratios, lower FiO2 requirements, lower ventilator settings, clinical and objective readiness assessments, definition of weaning success. Weaning success is achieved when a patient is extubated and does not require any form of ventilatory support for at least 48 hours following extubation. Definition of weaning failure. Weaning failure is characterized by a patient's inability to pass a spontaneous breathing trial, SBT, or the need for reintubation within 48 hours after extubation. Spontaneous breathing trial, or SBT. An SBT is a prescribed period during which a patient breathes spontaneously while still intubated but without the aid of mechanical ventilation. It is a test to assess a patient's readiness for extubation. Simple weaning refers to cases where the patient successfully transitions off mechanical ventilation with minimal difficulty, generally on the first attempt. It is associated with a high rate of success and low mortality. Difficult weaning is a scenario where a patient requires multiple SBTs or up to seven days to be successfully weaned from mechanical ventilation. The focus is on identifying and addressing reversible causes for SBT failure. Prolonged weaning occurs when a patient fails more than three SBTs or requires more than seven days to be liberated from mechanical ventilation. It is associated with a lower rate of success and higher mortality. Pathophysiology of weaning failure. Imbalance of respiratory muscles and load. The most common mechanism for weaning failure is an imbalance between the force generating capacity of the respiratory muscles and the load they face once mechanical ventilation is discontinued. Airway and lung dysfunction. Increased airway resistance. Presence of an endotracheal tube, tracheal injuries, small airway diseases like asthma and COPD contribute to increased airway resistance. Reduced compliance. Factors like pulmonary edema, pleural fluid, ascites, elevated abdominal pressures, and obesity reduce lung compliance. Intrinsic positive end expiratory pressure. Increased airway resistance is associated with the development of intrinsic PEEP, which can result from high breathing frequency, loss of lung elastic recoil, and expiratory flow limitation. PEEP leads to pulmonary hyperinflation and impairs diaphragmatic function. Diagnostic and therapeutic interventions are flexible bronchoscopy, gold standard for assessing upper airway resistance, 
non-invasive ventilation and endotracheal stents, used to relieve resistance, bronchodilators, reduce bronchoconstriction, diuretics, reduce lung and chest wall edema, thoracentesis and paracentesis, improves chest compliance, laryngeal edema, associated with prolonged intubation and increases the risk of reintubation, a cuff leak test is used as an indicator for laryngeal edema. The cuff leak test. Specificity and sensitivity. High specificity but moderate sensitivity in predicting post-extubation airway obstruction. Risk factors for post-extubation strider. Traumatic intubation. Intubation for over six days. Large endotracheal tube. Female gender. And unplanned extubation. Systemic steroid therapy reduces reintubation and post-extubation strider rates. Weaning-induced cardiac dysfunction. The mechanisms are, cardiac dysfunction during weaning can result from various factors such as a decrease in intrathoracic pressure, activation of adrenergic tone, hypoxemia, hypercapnia, and increased work of breathing. These factors can lead to an acute rise in left ventricular end diastolic pressure and cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Diagnostic techniques. Electrocardiogram. Detects ischemic changes like T-wave inversions or ST-segment elevations. Transthoracic echocardiography. Diagnoses diastolic dysfunction and evaluates LV relaxation. Lung ultrasonography. Assesses diastolic dysfunction. Biomarkers. Serum B-type natriuretic peptide and N-terminal proBNP serve as markers of cardiovascular dysfunction. Management strategies for this are. Diuretics. Reduce global volume overload and LVEDV, leading to a marked reduction in LVEDP. Nitrates. Cause systemic venous dilation, reducing central blood volume in LV afterload. Vasodilators. Levosimindan, milrinone, amrinone, and enoximone decrease RV afterload and improve LV function. Phosphodiesterase-5 inhibitors. Effective in patients with COPD and pulmonary hypertension. Beta blockers. Used in conjunction with ACE inhibitors and calcium channel blockers for LV diastolic dysfunction. Cognitive dysfunction factors contributing to weaning failure. Delirium, depression, anxiety. Major contributors to weaning failure in ICU patients with prolonged admissions. Sleep disturbances. Caused by frequent monitoring, medications like opioids and benzodiazepines, and mechanical ventilation itself. Older age and comorbidities, adversely affect the weaning process. Diaphragmatic dysfunction, causes are, COPD, ICU-acquired weakness, ICUAW, neuromuscular disorders, ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction, phrenic nerve injury, diagnostic measures are, maximal inspiratory pressure, transdiaphragmatic pressure, diaphragmatic ultrasound, diaphragm electromyography, treatment are, Phrenic nerve stimulation devices like the LungPacer DPT system have shown promise in alleviating weaning failure. Metabolic and endocrine dysfunction. Causes are hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesemia, adrenal insufficiency, hypothyroidism. Treatment are corticosteroid use, strict glycemic control, thyroid supplementation, gastrointestinal and renal dysfunction causes are Intra-abdominal conditions, acute kidney injury, consequences are, increased inspiratory pressures, longer duration of mechanical ventilation, increased length of stay in ICU, nutrition causes are, evaluation is done by, body mass index, plasma albumin concentration, nitrogen balance, management is by, energetic needs should be determined by indirect calorimetry to prevent under or overfeeding. Process of usual weaning is done by first readiness assessments, conducted 48 to 72 hours into ICU admission. Sedation vacation is crucial. Reversible factors like electrolyte imbalances and volume overload should be corrected. Rapid shallow breathing index, RSBI, is checked. RSBI less than 105 means 97% probability of successful extubation. RSBI greater than 105 means 64% probability of extubation failure. Spontaneous breathing trials, SBT. Techniques are T-piece trial. Patient disconnected from ventilator, provided additional oxygen. Pressure support ventilation, PSV, trial. 
performed without disconnecting the patient, using low levels of pressure support. Automated tube compensation, ATC, reduces work of breathing and allows prediction of successful extubation. Duration for SBT. Tolerance of a 30 to 120 minute SBT should prompt consideration for permanent ventilator liberation. Failed SBT. Causes for failed SBT must be identified. Reattempt SBT every 24 hours after correcting reversible causes. Post failure management following a failed SBT, patients should receive stable, non fatiguing, comfortable form of ventilatory support. Early mobilization reduces incidence of ICU acquired weakness, improves functional capacity and number of ventilator free days, decreases delirium, ICU readmissions, and ICU loss. Protocolized rehabilitation recommended for patients ventilated greater than 24 hours. Weaning techniques. What's the evidence? Spontaneous breathing trials are SBT. TPs and PSV are commonly used but differ in work of breathing. PSV may hasten extubation but risk underestimating work of breathing. Seminal trials. Spanish lung failure trial favored once daily trial of spontaneous breathing over SIMV and PSV. Brochard's study showed fewer weaning failures with PSV. High risk patients. PSV may hasten extubation without increased risk of reintubation. Extubation to preventive non invasive ventilation, NIV, is recommended. Resting respiratory muscles. Reconnection to MV after successful SBT did not significantly reduce the risk of reintubation. Multi center trial 68.7% were extubated after SBT. SBT is widely used in the U.S., but outcomes were worse compared to direct extubation. Standardized weaning protocols. Initial use backed by three RCTs. Associated with decreased duration of MV, lower costs, and fewer reintubations. If you like our videos PLZ subscribe and like. Now coming to the take-home messages. Evaluate readiness to wean early and mitigate risk factors. For failed weaning trials, identify and correct reversible causes. Always follow a systemic method for assessment carefully evaluating each organ system. Standardized weaning protocols are generally beneficial. Patient-customized care is crucial. Let patients be the best guides for weaning decisions.